Welcome to today's webinar. It's our Congressional Fellowship Informational Session. I am Alex, the Director of Programs at APEX, the Asia, Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Uh, if you're new to us, we are a 26-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit, and we're dedicated to promoting API representation at all levels of the political process. And so I'm really excited today to talk to one of our longest running and signature programs, the Congressional Fellowship. So just to give a little bit of background before we get into the actual discussion here, our Congressional Fellowship was started in 1997, and this uh, prestigious program has graduated 79 alumni so far who have worked across a whole bunch of different House and Senate offices and actually a couple of federal agencies as well. And so today we have three great alumni of this program here. They're gonna talk a little bit about their fellowship experience, um, about what they did as a fellow, why they applied, kind of where the fellowship has led them since, just to give our audience a better idea of really what it is that this program offers, what they can get out of it, and for you to decide, is it the right fit for you? Should you apply? Should you apply soon? Which my answer is yes, you should apply today. Um, and really to get your questions answered about, you know, what does it mean to work on the Hill um, as a congressional fellow and where can that lead you? And so, like I mentioned, I have three great panelists. They have a range of backgrounds, um, which is kind of why I'm really excited to have them gathered here. They all came to the fellowship at different points in their life from different background experiences, and they're all actually in unique places. But what's great um, and what Apex really loves to see is that these alumni are all still on the Hill as well, too, really showing their commitment to public service, which is the intent of Apex here, which is to just increase our AAPI leaders in public service. And so um, our three alumni, first we have Kota uh, Mizutani. He was a fellow in 2017 to 2018, working in the office of Congressman Mark Takano. Our second fellow is Manpreet Teji. She was also in the class of 2017 to 18, and she was with Congresswoman Judy Chu, also the chair of uh, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, KPAC. And then our third panelist is actually one of our most recent fellow alumni. Uh, Erica Denoyu was in our latest class, class of 2019 to 2020, and she did her fellowship in the office of Congresswoman Grace Meng from New York. And so uh, just to let everybody know that the majority of our time, um, hopefully we spent on Q&A. We will take questions in the Q&A box if you join us on Zoom. Uh, you can type it into that box below. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, feel free to leave your question in the chat. We have a couple moderators who will help funnel the questions to us to get those answered. And if you registered ahead of time and pre-submitted a few questions, we got a whole list of those two. We only have about an hour, but we're going to try to get through as many as we can during this time to be the most helpful for you. Um, and then the last thing um, I'm going to note too, uh, before we just jump into this uh, discussion today is that if you need more information or if we don't cover something, uh, just go to apex.org. Um, go to our fellowship page. We have a FAQ on there. If you have questions, you can email into programs at apex.org. And I'm actually going to ask Keejan, who's on the line too, to drop those links and that email address into the chat so that everybody can see that as well too. Um, and let's just get this kicked off. So um, as I mentioned, we have our three panelists, Koda, Munpreet, and Erica. And I want you guys to kind of start out by just giving us a little bit of background, a little bit of context about how you arrived at the fellowship. So First question is, why did you apply for the Apex Fellowship and what were you doing prior to, the, to coming to the fellowship? Uh, how about we start with Kota? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kota, as Alex mentioned. Uh, before I was a fellow, uh, I was a student. Uh, I saw a, a question in the Q&A here. I was a college senior myself. Uh, and uh, I was uh, wrapping up um, some, uh, a number of uh, internships that I'd done uh, in DC before. I knew that I was really interested in legislative politics, especially on the federal level. And I was also uh, really passionate about uh, advocating for the API community and, and working to advance uh, the community's interests. So the intersection of that uh, for me was the APEX Fellowship, being able to uh, work on both API issues, but also get you know experience myself uh, in, in Congress. I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Why don't we go to you, Manfred? Thank you. So um, my name is Manpreet and I, right before I applied right for the fellowship, I was actually in my third year of law school. Um, I had decided that I wanted to work in government, but during my third year of law school was actually the election and um, Trump won his election. And at that point I had to make a decision of if I wanted to look at agencies or if I wanted to look at the Hill. and. Um, I really wanted to work with um, a democratic, you know, 
administration or um, come on the Hill. And one of my good friends, you know, last minute encouraged me to apply to the Apex Fellowship. Um, and at the time, I, I didn't know if this was going to be exactly the fit I wanted. Um, but I applied and um, it, it actually worked out to the best of my benefit. I always wanted to do policy work. I always wanted to work with the broader Asian American community, um, similar to what Koda said. And I have also wanted to make sure that my work is very geared towards um, social justice and civil rights issues. And I was lucky enough to work with uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu, who um, has been a champion for the Asian American community and also um, work under her hat as KPAC. So um, that's kind of where I was at. It was a great opportunity for me to take my legal degree and apply it in a legislative staffer way. Great, thanks so much, Manfri, and to you, Erica. Hello, everyone, uh, Erica here. Uh, so, you know, uh, I came into APEX uh, with 10 years of working as a, a teacher in public schools, um, but concurrently I was uh, also serving as a leader for my community. Um, actually, Kota and I knew each other through the Japanese American Citizens League, um, and just, uh, you know, in my role as a teacher and also trying to push for more civil rights and, you know, giving a, vo a voice to people in the community, you know, I felt a lot of barriers. Um, and one disconnect that I felt was um, we need to have more uh, policy-based advocacy work within our communities. So I realized that in order to make more change, you know, I needed that policy experience. So <laughs> I made a, <laughs> Uh, a gamble and uh, decided to go back to grad school, uh, get an ed policy degree. Uh, and, you know, because I didn't have any interning experience or I didn't think I was going to have a career in policy, um, I really needed an alternative um, pathway into uh, the Hill. And also, you know, another traditional route to getting on the Hill is contacting your uh, your local delegation, but mine being a Republican and <laughs> wanting to uh, work for a Democrat, that wasn't a pathway for me. So uh, these are just a few reasons why I uh, am very thankful for the pathway of uh, Apex. Awesome. That's really good to hear. And uh, as you guys can kind of tell, uh, we have a few very different pathways. Nobody is exactly the same. And I guess I neglected to mention, although I'm putting on the moderator role today, I'm also an alumni of the fellowship program and, and found it through um, a different way as well to having a couple years as a second grade teacher before moving into the public policy world as well too. Uh, and so really what this, I hope it demonstrates to our audience is that um, what we really look for are people who have kind of a commitment to public service um, and interest in public policy, poly policy making, uh, and really desire to kind of get their foot, you know, in Capitol Hill, uh, a place that can be a little bit hard to, especially if you don't have prior connections, uh, to really, you know, get a foot in the door. And so that's what we're really aiming for with the Apex Fellowship. And so thank you all for sharing that. And I guess kind of to, finish setting the scene before we get into all these Q's and A's that we have going on here are, let's talk about your fellowship. Um, and, you know, after your placement offices, uh, can you talk to us about what is your current role today? Uh, where are you working? What are you doing? And how did your fellowship really take you to where you are today? And you know what, we're going to start with Coda again. Okay, sounds good. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, I was uh, coming into the Apex Fellowship as a college senior uh, and because of that I was I was a little bit <laughs> intimidated about the whole experience I had a lot of folks like Manpreet who had done a lot of great work uh, already before do, even doing the fellowship so I was like whoa what's, <laughs> what's going on and I realized that uh, each fellowship experience is incredibly uh, unique you can make it because you're in your own office it's a very unique experience so I was able to actually work with my staff to have an experience as a fellow that uh, um, really was, was, was a good stepping stone for me to get into the world of Congress and legislative politics uh, to begin with. So I had a wide range of, uh, of experiences and a lot of uh, different tasks that I was able, different projects that I was to take on uh, from writing policy memos uh, to, to writing speeches, so doing both kind of communications and policy. Uh, this really came in handy uh, because uh, later on uh, as we were, um, uh, 
uh, as the uh, House was coming under uh, Democratic uh, control, um, I was offered an opportunity to, to be a speechwriter, which is my current job. And had it not been for the flexibility and the incredible experience I had as an Apex Fellow and creating a really you know, wide, or having a lot of uh, a wide range of experiences, I would have not have had the speech writing experience prior uh, to take on this current role that I have right now. Awesome. And Manpreet? Thanks. Um, so I, my first day in my fellowship in Congresswoman Judy Chu's office was the day DACA got rescinded. So it was definitely all hands on deck, um, given the fact that Congresswoman Chu was very active in immigration. And as the chairwoman of KPAC, she was um, making sure that Asian American voices were elevated in the conversation with DACA. And I had an opportunity um, to kind of have a role in that. And throughout my time in Congresswoman Chu's office, just like Kota said, it's kind of what you make of it. Each fellowship is very different. Um, and in my experience, I was able to foster really good mentorship um, and guidance from our team in Congressman Chu's office. You know, they really taught me um, the hill ropes. You know, it's a learning curve when you start in, in, on the hill. Um, you don't learn legislative process that in depthly. I mean, maybe you do as a poli sci major, but in law school, you don't learn legislative process. And so to learn how, you know, House procedure works versus Senate procedure, you know, it's a huge learning curve, what it takes to get a bill introduced. And so they, you know, really threw me into the deep end of the pool, which was great because I was able to swim my way out and really learn what it's like to be an effective staffer on the Hill. And you know, one of the great things about the fellowship is that it also brings you up at a, brings you in in most offices at the legislative staffer level. And so you actually get to engage with legislative work. And so for me, that was great because I didn't have to, you know, start from a staff assistant role or start in a different role, um, especially with a law degree and especially with law school loans. You know, I was I was in a spot where I wanted to make sure I was taking the next step to build my career. And so I created great relationships with um, Congresswoman Chu's office and they really, really taught me the ropes. And when it was time, when my fellowship was nearing its end, I had frank conversations with my office and um, interviewed and received an opportunity to work in Senator Durbin's judiciary team. And I'm originally from Illinois, so it was very special for me to work for my home state senator. And um, with a law degree, I really wanted to focus on judiciary work. And so I wanted a role that would have a JD advantage, um, which that, so I was hired on as a legislative correspondent. And then a year and a half later, I believe, um, I got promoted to associate counsel. So now I'm on Senator Durbin's judiciary team. And I, I truly, to this day, still remember, you know, when I'm working on things throughout my portfolio here, things that I learned from my fellowship. I always, you know, talk to my uh, former bosses and now mentors and friends about, you know, thank you so much for like letting me ask the hundred questions that I had because now it makes me actually know what I'm talking about or know what I'm doing in my office. So I found I found that this fellowship really, you know, trained you in how to be a good staffer. And I think the office really invests. Most offices really invest in their fellowships de fellows development so that they can also, you know carry the pipeline and build more um, Asian American Hill staffers on the Hill. So um, that's where I'm at right now. And the fellowship was very instrumental um, to where I've gotten. Today. Awesome. Thank you, Manpreet. And uh, you also just jogged my memory too that if people are interested in knowing or, you know, what office have we placed in, we typically, you know, traditionally have placed mostly with the Asian American Pacific Islanders at Congress. Uh, a lot of the members of the Asian Pacific American Caucus, KPEC, uh, but if you take a look at our website, we have a tab that have all the fellowship alumni listed and their placement offices. You'll see that we've placed across a wide range, you know, wide range of offices. We are also nonpartisan as well, too. So we do accept people of all political beliefs and values, and we do our best to try to match you up with an office that aligns with your beliefs as well, too. I um, want to go to Erica, though, about really, you know, what was your fellowship experience like and how did that really lead to where you are and what is your current role? A lot of questions, but can you lead us through that, please? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll start with currently I'm working for Congresswoman Barbara Lee uh, and you know <laughs> the thing with being a staffer <laughs> you have like 10 you know <laughs> a bajillion different issue areas um, but my primary one is healthcare so I'm very busy right now <laughs> and uh, but also she leads on economic justice social justice issues securing social safety nets um, and you know I have to say, you know, hands down, any of my successes now is due to, you know, my experience last year uh, serving as a Congresswoman Grace Meng's fellow. Uh, and, you know, there's, you know, you, you learn about subject areas and I was able to bring in my expertise uh, being in the field of education, but really learning and applying the legislative process is something that really happens you know, through experience when you're working on the Hill. So I, I'm just really grateful that, you know, since day one of my fellowship, um, the office uh, really pulled me in and said, Erica, what are you passionate about? What do you want to accomplish? And, you know, I was ready to, the first day I came in with a 12 page document of all the legislation <laughs> I wanted to enact. Um, but, you know, just I'm really grateful that my office provided me to the opportunity to engage in the legislative process, you know, uh, writing bills, uh, working towards passing bills, um, you know, helping with hearings, um, you know, a lot of technique and skill that offices are looking for when they're hiring you on as a legislative assistant, um, you know, and I will say, um, I think my cohort, my Apex cohort, was one of the largest, the, the largest, right? I will confirm, actually, yeah, it is the largest to date. We are, you know, over the last 23 years of this program being in existence, we are growing, which is great, and it's encouraging. So you guys had seven people. Uh, we have seven current fellows on the Hill, too, and looking to grow even more in the years to come. Yeah, so... Although, you know, sorry, I like to say that my class of 15 to 16 was the largest up to that point as well, too, with six, but you guys have finally bested us. So we got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, as Kota mentioned, the experience is really what you make of it. And so the office that you'll be paired with, you know, they're looking for what experiences and what assets you bring to the uh, the office uh, and but you know whatever you bring it's it's just you have to be a quick learner and you know every every day every moment is a learning experience um, and um, yeah it, it was just um, I guess I'll stop there there's too too much that well, happened last year. <laughs> actually you're you're thanks for like kind of stepping into that because um uh, we're seeing a few questions come in, and there's actually one that was pre-submitted I want to touch in about kind of the day-to-day, -day, but just a reminder for our attendees, feel free to drop a question in the Q&A. Um, for some of them that are a little bit more processed about the application, I'll try to find that time for me to answer that from the Apex side of things, too. We're definitely going to try to talk a lot about the experience and what to expect as a fellow to help you gauge if it's the right fit for you. Um, and also, like I mentioned, too, if we don't get to all of them today, we'll do our best to answer them on our own time and follow up as well. But like you're saying, Erica, I mean, there's a lot, you know, that happens with the fellow. It's a big learning curve, as I'm sure everybody can also agree from your experiences. And so one of the uh, pre-submitted questions was, I'm new to public policy and service, but have a growing interest. Um, what do you actually do as a fellow on a day-to-day -day basis? So I guess I'll start out. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, yeah, even as a fellow, um, I, I was, uh, from week one, <laughs> um, I was surprised that I was tasked with writing speeches for the Congresswoman and, um, you know, writing memos, policy memos, also leading on legislative ideas. Uh, and, you know, uh, we'll also spend our time, uh, a good portion of our time communicating with constituent and constituent organizations to learn what their priorities are and what their needs are. Um, sometimes, <clears throat> so uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng was an appropriator, uh, and uh, Barbara Lee that I'm working for now is also an appropriator. And so a lot of my meetings, you know, centered around, you know, funding needs and mm. you know, what issues uh, groups are facing. Uh, so typically there's a legislative ask with whatever meeting that we take, but um, so, you know, it was my job to take in all that information and figure out, okay, what are the next steps, you know, is it going to end up 
uh, becoming new language or a, an appropriations request or is this a new bill idea or is this something that the district office uh, needs to take care of you know so um, a lot of times we we spent you know researching um, and just gauging what the issue is and if there indeed is a federal policy solution that you know is is um, also appropriate for the congresswoman to lead on okay awesome um, and I think that is a unique experience working for an appropriator um, rather than, you know, uh, an authorizer per se too. And uh, Coder and Manpreet, do you guys want to talk a little bit about what your day-to-day -day might have looked like as best as you can? Sure. Um, it's a couple years now, so I, I <laughs> almost can't remember. But um, for me, it was definitely, you know, immigration was um, at its cutting edge. And so a lot of my portfolio at the time was immigration census and um, civil rights and then also assisting with the kpac agenda and so a lot of my work was like erica said meeting with constituents meeting with stakeholders and groups and also working with other offices who were kind of leading the force in immigration and working with them to kind of see where if congressman Chu aligned with it or not um, i also assisted a lot with um the legislative director and managing some of the active bills that were happening. And then um, I also, you know, staffed a lot of meetings with Congressman Minshew and got to interact with her and how she um, worked with the groups as well. And then on the KPAC side of things, I also helped manage a lot of the KPAC caucus meetings, manage, and a lot of it is like, directly with the members, making sure who's walking in, what's going on there and the coordination and managing um, information that is dispersed to the caucus as well. So I think all three of us can probably say like one, <laughs> each day is not unique. Um, every day is different. Um, a session day, a, a lot of times a session day, you're also monitoring the floor. You're also monitoring what um, bills are active. Um, for me, in the beginning, a lot of my writing was focused on co-sponsor recommendations for other bills and letter sign-on recommendations. And then as well, um, it, it went into writing memos for the boss, briefing the boss on certain issues, working with other team members um, to move forward an agenda. You know, as a fellow, you'll usually be reporting to someone before you report to the member of Congress directly. So. I would always go through the legislative director or the legislative council or the executive director of KPAC to go through my material before it went to um, Congressman Minshew. So um, it was a great way to um, kind of check yourself. But yeah, each day is not unique. So <laughs> kind of hard to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always great to hear like, you know, if, how people summarize it to the day to day on the Hill. And I'm not sure, Koda, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I mean, totally agree. Every day was so different. I think one of the things that I really loved about um, my fellowship was that even though I was uh, like the Education and Labor Committee fellow, I was like assigned to those issue areas, as was alluded, like the, like the policy issues that I was working with, interacting with, went far beyond that. Um, and that was, you know, they, that was the office letting me uh, take the, that liberty to explore other issue areas. And I'm, you know, eternally grateful for the, uh, the Congressman Takano's office for allowing me to do that. Um, but I think it just speaks to not only the types of projects that you work on, from speeches to memos to voting recommendations, but really the policy areas themselves as well. So it was a really great experience to learn how those different issue areas, for example, impact the API community and how different things get done in those respective policy areas, uh, whether it's differences in committee structure or, you know, just a gazillion things. But I, I can't, you know, reinforce enough that like every day I was learning something completely new, and that was really, you know, from I from some from some people's experiences of the senior year of college, that was really awesome to just get to learn so much every day. Awesome, um, and that's good to hear. And I kind of want to talk about, you know, one of the big things that uh, we really hope that our fellows take out of this is the network that they create, right, um, and the connections that they make by being able to have this opportunity to move to DC to be able to do this fellowship and get their foot in the door on Capitol Hill too. We have a question here in the q and I wanna address. Um, let me find it again. This is a lot more than I last checked. Uh, can you all speak to the network that this fellowship provides and the extent of the relationships you've built? How has it helped you in your role and your professional life in general? 
And are you connected with the fellowship alumni? Um, so I, is it okay if we just jump in? Yeah, feel free. Okay, so there's a wonderful um, group. It's called the Apex Alumni Association. Um, and they um, are, it's, it's a, it's a group that basically has all the alumni of, from the Fel Apex Fellowship Program. And it served as a great resource for me when I was a fellow as well. Um, something, that I've, something that I really admired when I was a fellow was the fact that the Apex Fellowship alumni family kind of, is a family. It, it truly you know, takes you in. They want to foster relationships with you. You are assigned a mentor um, in the fellowship program who can kind of help you through the tough conversations um, or during your fellowship um, to help you grow as a fellow. And then, you know, w given the fact that there is an association, it opens up the opportunity for you to meet so many other fellows and interact with them. Um, a lot of times, you know, when I'm assigned to a mentee who's a current fellow, if there is someone who could be better of assistance to them, I usually connect them to that, that, that person, another fellow for them to connect to. Um, a lot of times Alex is um, connecting me to current fellows, you know, so I think the network is so vast. And what I've learned is so many of the uh, alumni really do want to help um, current fellows. We're all invested in you and we really, really want to see you all succeed and get the job that you want after the fellowship. So if your goal is to stay on the Hill, you know, more often than not, a lot of folks are going to help you and um, push you forward. So um, I think that the network has been, is very vast and very helpful. And then also the offices that you work in, they also are going to invest in you as well. So, you know, it's always important to build that network as well. I mean, in my situation, it was very helpful. Um, my office did really help me with the networking aspect and I was able to meet a lot of other people and a lot of it is also what you put into it you know seeking out the op if you want to seek out the opportunity it's very easy to find people to connect with mm -hmm. if you don't want to then it's then it's hard but I think that if you even show a little bit of interest um the network will just come to you <laughs> yeah awesome does anyone else want to happen or yeah I, I will just say yeah I, I really love the alumni network um it's the it's a really safe space where you know if if i ever felt like i had some kind of dumb question you know although no question is dumb <laughs> um i felt like i could reach out to an alumni and ask you know hey what's this deal about appropriations you know <laughs> so um it's just really great uh to have a network of people and you know like Manpri said if they don't know the answer you know there'll be someone else there to support you um, and also by being part of Apex, um, as opposed to a, a different pathway, not connected to the tri caucuses, you know, the reach is a lot closer to the Hispanic caucus and the Black caucus. And so you're part of a really vast network. Um, and uh, so the proximity is great. Um, also having a title as an Apex fellow, uh, it, it's a great point of leverage to secure meetings and coffees with others. Um, and so just, um, yeah, really the opportunity to reach out and broaden your network uh, is a huge uh, asset to um, uh, this fellowship. Awesome. Um, Coda, do you want to add something? Yeah, no, I think okay. just some of the, I, I'm seeing some of the, the Q&A questions yeah. too. A lot of the, um, a lot of the the logistical obstacles of of like moving to DC, finding yeah. housing, uh, just I don't know, learning the metro system, like all of those small things. Um, definitely, like having the the having the the circle of friends that you developed through Apex was was, was really important too. I think there were a number of times that Mom Preet reached and you know, I reached out to each other, just like just just check in and see how we're doing. Totally like outside of work, I think it just speaks to the fact that on top of the professional relationships. And uh, the great networking, uh, honestly, you know, this is just a great group of people that are just really committed to this issue. And I'm like very, I'm very, I feel very lucky to have found a, a, a nice group of, of friends. Awesome. I'm glad you brought up the housing question. We have a few of those more process driven things about the nuts and bolts of the fellowship. Uh, I just kind of want to touch on that really quickly are that um, no, 
as you've mentioned, I think this question that housing is not provided, but what we can do is connect you to people who are already in the city too, like our alumni network to help you with the housing search. Um, I want to actually touch on, we have a few questions kind of about issue areas and working on specific policies while on the Hill. So um, can you guys talk to really about when you, you know, became a fellow, was there a specific issue area you wanted to work on? Did you get that opportunity though to work on it? Um, if so, and if not, why not? If so, like, how did that work out? Can you speak a little bit to that? Or did you not have an issue area and did you find one through the fellowship? So just to give an, uh, you know, our audience kind of an idea of what to expect becoming a fellow in terms of having the portfolio of issues that you want on Capitol Hill and how that works with your placement. I, I was really lucky that one of the reasons why um, uh, Rep, Rep Meng's office wanted me was my experience in education. And this was what I solely wanted to work on uh, coming to the Hill. And so to have the opportunity um, you know, one of the perks of being a fellow is you can really, you have the luxury of spending your time on, you know, it depends on the office, but I had the luxury of spending my time mostly on education. You know, I had a few other areas, you know, environment, um, animals, um, you know, KPAC and whatnot, but uh, I could really spend more time compared to my role now as a legislative assistant uh, to focus on the issue area. So for me, it was a dream year. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is a conversation that you need to have, um, you know, within your interview process and with each office. Um, but if you are motivated and have the desire to uh, work on a specific issue area, you know, I, I would say definitely be vocal uh, about that and find an office that can, can help you engage in that more. Um. Unless someone else wants to chime in, I actually do want to combine it with, I see a question of, does Apex also place fellows in foreign policy offices or departments? Uh, if so, where have they previously worked? I do want to touch on that. Yes, we have had fellows previously uh, work for members on the Foreign Affairs Committee specifically on those issues. When Apex places uh, fellows with the placement offices, the host office um, has the ultimate deciding authority whether they want to hire that fellow or not. And usually it's done you know, after a few interviews based off of fit. Um, is the, you know, does the fellow and their interest and their work experience, does it align with what the office needs? So if somebody is looking for a fellow to work on foreign affairs issues, they'll obviously seek out somebody who either has an expressed interest or maybe some work experience um, or maybe some educational background in that area to work on that portfolio. I do want to just speak on personal experiences that, you know, education was my number one issue as well. When I got my fellowship um, with Ami Vera in 2015, uh, they actually had a legislative assistant at the time whose, you know, one of his main priorities was education. So they made it pretty clear that I will not be the main lead on education, but they knew that was definitely a passion area for me too. I had experience in it. And so they found ways to, you know, have me back up projects or take on a little bits of the education portfolio um, to kind of help me out and give me some experience in that issue area that I wanted to work in. So there's ways around it too. And one thing that I always tell Hill staff and people, uh, who are starting fellowships on the Hill too, is that the Hill really is what you make it. Um, and that even if you might not have the ideal portfolio at the start too, um, I think over time, you know, you'll be able to work your way into the areas that you want to work on and you never know. Um, I, I think big piece of advice that we always tell our fellows going in is keep an open mind. I'm sure all of you all have heard that here um, on this call is that we really encourage our fellows to have an open mind because you never know, um, you know, if you get assigned an issue and you really dive into it, you might find that you have, you know, um, secret passion for housing policy or whatnot. All right. Um, let's see. Another good question that we have here are, um, sorry, we've gotten so many more. Uh, I see two about the same thing about favorite projects. Is there a favorite or a significant project that you guys want to talk about that you did during your fellowship? I think for me, um, without getting into the specifics of it, um, you know, when I started in Congresswoman Shu's office, um, I believe at the time, the person that handled immigration policy, their counsel had just left. So they were hiring someone for that position. But given the fact that I was a fellow and I had just joined, um, I was given the opportunity to kind of take a lead on some of the immigration pieces um, while the LD had managed it above me. And so 
for me, it was really exciting um, to kind of see a bill from start to finish. So, you know, the person who had just left handed off, um, I guess, a bill that was still kind of in the works of, um, you know, uh, finalizing text. And so on my end, I had to, you know, work with uh, the legislative council in the house to get the text finalized, work with the groups and the stakeholders. And then, you know, then we were in kind of a holding block to see when we should we introduce. And that's when I kind of got introduced to politics on the Hill and trying to figure out what, like how you time everything. Because when I worked in the house, that was when we were in the minority. So everything was messaging. And so I, you know, got to learn when is the right time to strike when it's hot? When, when is it going to ma matter the most and how to build a press strategy over it? And so over it. So um, I got to see that in real time, you know, the chief of staff called me in and um, the legislative director and was like, okay, I think it's time to move on this bill because it's about to get hot. And we did. And it was probably the most tiring time of my whole fellowship. I was very tired. It was two days of, you know, staying very late in the, at, in the office, trying to plan so many different components, working with the stakeholders, working with the offices, working on a staff briefing that coincided with the bill, working on the press outreach, which our press, our communications director took over. And I didn't even realize at the end of it that I would be staffing the boss at this event until I got to the press event and I was like, oh, I guess there's no one else here. Usually I was always with someone else. So it was the most tiring, but also one of the most rewarding experiences for me because I got to learn how you see something from start to finish. And also, you know, I, I keep saying this, but I truly, it does matter a lot that you build good relationships with your office because they really help you hone in on those skills. So my office really helped me in learning those skills. They could have done it overnight by themselves, but they put me through, you know, the tough conversations I need to have needed to have and took time and patience to teach me it. And it was truly a very fun and rewarding experience to see it full way through and um, to see the Congresswoman happy about, you know, the introduction as well. Awesome. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm not sure if you guys had anything significant you guys wanted to share. Otherwise, I think we can get through some more of these questions. All right. Um, we have a specific one that I'd earmark for you, Erica, because you were a fellow in this previous year. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what it was like transitioning because of the coronavirus? What were some of the changes that needed to be made? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so we're probably the first hybrid cohort year as well. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, transitioning like any other office, I mean, it, it was a, a learning curve. Um, although, you know, I guess I was lucky in the fact that, um, you know, I already had built a rapport and, um, you know, we, uh, I knew uh, what my colleagues' um, working style was. So transitioning to an online format wasn't that crazy. Um, and, you know, depending on which office you're with, you know, the communication style um, really, differs as well. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think the most difficult aspect of, you know, and, and that is the most difficult aspect even today is balancing, you know, work hours and, you know, your personal hours. Um, and so just, you know, drawing a line and finding ways to, you know, take breaks and schedule, you know, time for yourself. Um, I think this is something that, I learned the hard way because I was pushing so hard to just, you know, be the best that I could be, but, you know, we have our limits. Um, so, you know, really being honest with yourself with, you know, what understanding, you know, you are valued and what you can bring, but also you are only human. So, you know, being uh, honest with your, um, you know, legislative director, your supervisor about your needs as well is, I think, a critical component. Mm -hmm. I, I think I also want to address part of the virtual part of it too, because I think you did a fantastic job of transitioning. Like I'd say, give a lot of props to you and your class for kind of managing that hybrid mode. Um, just want to address for our audience that currently our class 
Uh, it really depends on the policies of your placement office. The majority of our fellows are in person with some with a hybrid um, or in office option available. Um, and that's an agreement that needs to be reached. Of course, we want to make sure that our fellows are comfortable with the working agreement um, in their office as far as 2021 to 2022 fellowship goes. That is still up in the air. Um, and, you know, as we get closer to those dates, it will be, you know, a conversation that we'll need to have with the people who become our fellowship finalists who get a secured placement with an office and that office's policies. Um, at Apex, you know, we definitely want to make sure that the health and safety is the priority of our fellows first and foremost too, and also that the comfort level um, with the office's policies. Okay, so this one's a little bit more targeted for Manpreet, um, as you are the one with uh, the law degree here. Can you speak to pros and cons of uh, doing law school before, possibly doing law school after the fellowship and how that ties into your experience? The key question, mm -hmm. uh, literally the question of the day that I get every day. So um, I get this one a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I think it really depends on what you're trying to seek out. For me, um, you know, Kota knows this. When I when I started my fellowship, my dream was to work on Senate Judiciary Committee for Senator Durbin, and I knew that that position was going to be something that needed to have a JD. A lot of times, people who do work on Judiciary Committee, especially in the Senate, have JDs and have law degrees. Um, I think in the House, it's majority. A lot of people have uh, JDs. So. I knew that when I was um, in law school and I was thinking about government, I would want that role in government to be something that had that JD preference to it. Otherwise, why did I go to law school? And so um, every job opportunity that I was seeking out um, during the fellowship was something that was geared towards some sort of JD preferred or, you know, uplifted the title counsel to it. So I applied to the legislative correspondence position, a correspondent position in Senator Durbin's office. And in that position, they were looking for someone with a JD because they looked at that job as a stepping stone. Legislative correspondents on the Hill don't necessarily have JDs. It's just what the office was dependent on. And because it was on his Judiciary Committee staff, they wanted someone with a JD. Um, and so it's a very good question that um, has come in. And I think that it really is just what you're trying to seek out. I think you can be a very good policy staffer on the Hill and not have a JD. Um, you can be a very good policy leader on an issue for your boss. I mean, there are I mean, so many legislative directors and chiefs of staff on the Hill who have been, have had many years of experience on the Hill leading policy issues who don't have law degrees. But if you really do want to hone in on a space that does have the advantage of having a law degree, if you want to work on judiciary, if you want to work on uh, judicial nominations, if you want to work in a space where, you know, the law degree is valued, especially where, you know, with judiciary, when we're dealing with a lot of things that are constitutional law based, uh, um, it's helpful to have a law degree and the employers want that sometimes. And so um i think that's very valuable to have however if you are you know recently graduating from college my biggest mo is uh, message is that you should always get work experience before you go to law school and if this is the opportunity that you're looking for to get work experience to kind of decide if government or the hill is for you then that's great but um just know that the positions that you probably will secure after your fellowship won't be law based, like if they're looking for someone with a JD. And that's fine. I have um, I have a mentee of mine who works on the Hill and they are gonna apply to law school now and they were able to build good experience assisting a team of lawyers and that sort. Of. So it's really what you make of it. If I, I was very geared and focused towards wanting a position that was gonna utilize my legal uh, degree. Okay. Thank you, Manfred, for that. Um, that's always a tough question. Uh, thank you for always being so generous with your answer. I know you get that one a lot. And um, if other people, you know, they always ask me and I usually forward them on to you or other of our fellows who have JDs as well to answer that question. Um, let's talk a little bit about long-term 
uh, prospects as well too. We actually have an interesting question of, would you recommend applying if you're not sure if you're interested in working on the Hill long term? And maybe speak to where have other alumni worked after the fellowship um, and about you guys too. Um, and might even ask, is you know, did you guys plan on working on the Hill long term? It just so happens that you three alumni are still on the Hill. That's not the case for all of our alumni. Is there someone who wants to kind of talk about that? I mean, Sorry. I just, oh, go ahead, Coach. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, so that's a little bit tough, right? Because I, I'm still on the Hill, but I think just from knowing, you know, um, other fellows who've gone off, I mean, there are certainly opportunities. I mean, when you're, you're like feeling meetings with folks, I mean, you're meeting with people who are not on the Hill constantly. So there are opportunities to, um, to, to get that experience. It's not like once you take the Apex Fellowship, you're like on the track to only be a congressional staffer, although it's a great, <laughs> obviously it's a great path if, if that is what you want to do, uh, which was the case for me is that I knew I wanted to work uh, in Congress. Um, and I think I saw a question earlier about, should, is this something that you want to do if you've uh, been an intern before? And I'd actually say, um, yes, even if, you, even if you have prior Hill experience or you've never had experience and you don't know, I think this is a really good way uh, uh, to, to, to find out um, if the Hill is the place that you, you want to work in. Uh, for an intern or for folks who've been interns before, you've seen, you know, as an intern, most likely in a Hill office, you're taking care of a lot of uh, greeting people at the door, giving tours, answering the phones. That's a hugely important part of the Hill, and you've learned like a third of that as an intern. Now, as an Apex Fellow, so this is, this is actually my personal experience, too, is that I was once an intern into the fellowship. You learn like the, the whole other side. You learn the policy side, um, what some people might consider to be uh, the more exciting side, although I would contest that myself. Um, just to say that, again, I, I don't think, um, you know, you need to know that you want to work in Congress uh, to, to apply for this fellowship. It will not block out opportunities for you to leave or stay either way. Uh, it will only uh, enhance your knowledge of, of this, if this is the, a good place that you want to be in. And I'm just curious to hear, like, from our panelists, going into the fellowship, did you know at that time that Capitol Hill was the place you wanted to work, or did you um, use this kind of as an exploratory experience? I think for me, I, I was graduating from law school and, um, you know, I needed to get a, some sort of employment and I didn't know where the fellowship would take me. I mean, I had this dream to work on Senate Judiciary Committee, but, you know, if you're selected as a fellow, you'll quickly learn that that uh, jobs are really hard to get on the Hill. It's like a black hole. Um, and there's like one opportunity that opens up that like 200 people apply for. So I actually applied, I received it, and then I moved to DC for the fellowship, assuming that after nine months, I would move right back to Chicago, um, thinking that I wasn't going to get a job um, because I wanted to work for a Democrat. We were in the minority. So I was like, I'm not going to find a job. And so that's just how it is, you know? And I told my mom that I was like, in nine months, I'll be coming right back home. Um, and I think that that that's what I came with. And, you know, things worked out for me and I was able to get on the Hill. I guess I just want to add, like, there's so many opportunities you can seek out. I mean, we know other fellows who did, you know, after their fellowship go into, um, like nonprofit NGO, and then they came back to the Hill. Yeah. So that's it's true. really, you know, it's, it's what opportunities present themselves as well. And where you're at in terms of like, what risks you're willing to take if there is, you know, if there is a Hill job, but it's not high paying and, you know, you want to make sure you're more financially secure. So it's kind of seeing what opportunities present themselves. Um, and I think that, you know, at the time that I applied, I was not in any way sure that I was going to stay on the Hill. For me, you know, I, I got lucky, you know, well, I feel like I, I was lucky to be able to find a position right after the fellowship, um, but it was, um, I, I was very intentional about the reason for quitting my job of 10 years and going back to grad school and, you know, landing a job on the Hill. So I did put all, all of that on the line. And if I wasn't hired to work on the Hill, you know, it would have been a huge disappointment. Um, but um, I will say 
you know, everything that I've learned, um, nothing is wasted, I think. And so if I didn't find a position on the Hill, I would probably have been working for an educational advocacy organization and they would have valued uh, my skill set of working uh, on the Hill in front of a appropriator. Uh, so, you know, all of that, I mean, this um, fellowship just opened more doors than I would originally had. Uh, so, you know, definitely this is a wonderful way to, um, you know, create new opportunities. Okay. Um, I know we only have a few minutes, so let's try to knock out some of these. Uh, people are asking about advice for filling out the fellowship application. I saw another one about tips. What are ways to make yourself stand out in the interviews? Um, do you guys have any top level advice for making yourself a stellar candidate? I think um, for me, I think what stands out um, as a good applicant to work on the Hill is, you know, really showing why you're committed to public service and why you're committed to um, serving constituents of the United States. Um, a lot of times the applications that, you know, don't, don't um, make me excited about the candidates when they just talk about their own personal um, goals. I mean, you should talk about your goals, but they they just talk about themselves. And they don't talk about serving society, which is a lot of what our hill is. We are literally serving our constituents and listening to our bosses. So um, it, it, there, unfortunately, there's not a lot of I in our work sometimes. And so that is something I look for to see if they have that humility to kind of put that aside and realize that this is truly public service and um, let that shine through your application. Awesome. Um, yeah, Koda, you want to jump in? Yeah, I would just throw in, I think, I think flexibility is a big thing, as you probably gather from all of our responses. Nothing goes as originally planned, even if you end up getting your dream job like Mount Breathe. So, and I think that applies to just like working on the Hill. The more flexible you are, the more willing you are to just, you know, explore and, and, and kind of fill the, the need that, uh, that exists, I think the better. Awesome. Um, I do want to quickly run through our application timeline to let some people know um, and kind of the process. And uh, I think Manpreet, you've been part of the process, I believe, in the past too. So it's a pretty um, thorough process, I'd say, uh, on the Apex side of things. Our application deadline is January 31st. Um, I, there was a question too about whether it's rolling. No, it's not rolling, but you wanna make sure you get all of your materials in ahead of time because there's a lot of pieces that you need. Not in addition to the application, you need your resume, you need a cover letter, you need answers to three different essay questions, you need all your transcripts, official or unofficial are fine too, and you also need two letters of recommendation. I'm gonna address the letter of recommendation question. Typically, people take them from either professors or coworkers, colleagues, previous supervisors, anybody who can speak to your character, your leadership, your interest. Um, the one thing Manpreet uh, highlighted, I do wanna also go back to is interest in public service. That's what APEX is all about. We want to find the rising API leaders with a commitment for public service, whether it's directly for government or government adjacent, the nonprofit world. We're looking for people committed to public service. And so somebody who can kind of speak to that um, and about yourself as an applicant. Timeline wise, after the 31st, we have a multi-step process where we have a selection committee that's composed of APEX alumni, such as these fellowship alumni, uh, and also our APEX board members as well. They do um, multiple passes with a rubric looking for those qualities we've been talking, which is their commitment to public service, their leadership skills, their previous desired you know, experiences. Um, and also uh, after those few passes, then we also go to the interview phase. There will be one interview with APEX and the selection committee members as well. After that, your application um, is deemed either a finalist or a waitlist, depending on your status. And our finalists at that time around April are forwarded to the congressional offices. And to answer questions on placement, as you can tell, the Hill is a a uh, little bit of a finicky place um, and a lot of it really you know is situational to that office and what that office needs and what that office is looking for in a fellow to help them because um, they're pretty busy they got a lot going on and they don't have a lot of staff so they are the ones who review the finalist applications from apex uh, throughout the month of april and may they will contact our finalists for an interview uh, maybe multiple interviews sometimes they do a writing test and at that point too 
when they let Apex know who they want to be a fellow, we work together to make sure with the fellow that it's also the right fit for the kind of role that they're looking to do. That was really quick. I hope I answered a lot of those kind of procedural questions, but the biggest deadlines are January 31st. That's when applications are due. Following that, there will be a one-step review process. Well, we will let you know if you go on to round two for the interviews. Uh, following the interviews, we will let you know if you are waitlist or if you're gonna become a finalist. Um, and then finalists, then the last step is interviews with the congressional office placement around April or May. Uh, it's kind of give or take, um, obviously with COVID-19, the pandemic really disrupted our last placement cycle, throwing a lot of uncertainty into, are people actually gonna you know, take on a fellow? Are they gonna do it in person or virtual? Um, and then I think there was a question about when the fellowship starts that he didn't answer is that the fellowship does start um, in September, right after Labor Day for our nine month fellowships. Um, as we are closing out, because I know we're getting there, uh, if there's any other questions that the panelists want to answer that you see in the Q&A, feel free to shout them out. Otherwise, um, I do want to point out to our audience, so feel free to just let me know if you guys want to answer one of those, but I do want to let our audience know that what is unique um, are that we do have some specific tracks. So normally we have the General Congressional Fellowship, which is what we've described when you work with an office specifically on um, agreed upon portfolio, depending on the office's needs. This year, we also have a specific uh, tech and telecom fellowship for those people who either have working experience or an interest um, or have studied or have previous um, academic knowledge in tech and telecom policy and want to really invest in that. We also have that specific opportunity to indicate your interest. It's the same application form, but you select that you're interested in tech and telecom. There's gonna be just another additional um, essay question we have to explain you know, your previous working experience and your interest in the Tech and Telecom Fellowship to become eligible for that one. Um, was there one that you guys wanted to pick? No? Okay, well, in that case, because um, I know that we are getting close to time, we can start at the top is how many people get accepted. Um, as Erica said, her class was the largest at seven. It is a pretty competitive process. I don't know the exact statistics, but we, um, you know, admit only a small percentage of the applications that we receive to. Um, but we do encourage people to apply again if they've been waitlisted for a previous year or two. Um, for, there's a green card holders question if they're eligible. Have you seen actual cases? Uh, yes, so anybody with um, who, are, who is authorized to work in the United States uh, is eligible to apply to. I don't know historically of our 79 alumni of their statuses, but that does not affect your application. Um, it will not affect your consideration as an applicant. Um, and then, uh, are they guaranteed placement? What I mentioned is that uh, we make it pretty clear after you pass the APEX interview process, um, it is contingent upon your interview with the congressional office. Um, and if they decide to hire you on, then you officially become an APEX fellow starting in September. With elections, um, uh, with elections happening every two years in the House um, and the senators up every six years, uh, it is rare, but it does happen that we have had historically fellows in an office where that member has either retired or lost election. Um, in that case, you still remain an APEX fellow and we work to find a new placement office for you to finish out the last few months of your fellowship. Um, although that usually has not happened very often in our history. And yes, just two letters of recommendation, please, not three. Um, Okay, so I know that we covered a lot. Uh, I wish I could just actually go through and answer all these one by one, but thank you so much to our awesome panelists. Before we wrap up, um, do you guys have if any parting tips or words of advice that you'd like to impart to our audience before we wrap up? You know, the, the process of finally securing your office, uh, it, it felt long, but you know, I just encourage you to continue to engage in the process. Um, and you know, if I remember my first interview didn't go as well as I thought, but then I learned from it and applied those skills to the next one. So, you know, every opportunity is really helpful um, in becoming a better staffer eventually. So, best of luck. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just want to add um, kind of what Erica said, just be patient and humble in the process. Um, you know, Apex is wonderful for having this program and um, Alex has to, you know, manage a lot of moving pieces. So be patient with the process and be humble and be humble with the process. Um, it truly does shine um, if you are and, you know, it, it, take your time with the process. And if you do get selected, um, you'll feel that relief when you get through it. So good luck to everyone. And um, I'm excited to review many of your applications. I'll just say good luck to everyone who's applying. And if you're on the edge, apply. It's the best sneak preview of Congress that I could have ever asked for. And I'm just going to close out by saying too that having um, you know had an interest in the fellowship, I also you know want to say thanks to Apex, even though you know as a staffer now too for Apex that uh, I knew as an intern, I had interned during college uh, on Capitol Hill. I knew one day it's the place I wanted to return to, and Apex really kind of gave me that pathway to kind of move back out to DC for a paid nine month opportunity that led post that to another four year, uh, four plus year long career on Capitol Hill as well too. Uh, and so to those of you who are thinking about applying or are unsure, my recommendation is to um, apply um, and, you know, see where the opportunity might lead you. We have a lot of questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them, especially the ones that we might need to do a little bit more research on for you too. We'll try to follow up. Uh, you can always email programs at apex.org too, and one of us on staff will get back to you as soon as we possibly can to answer all of your questions about the application process. Um, I just want to answer because I still see a few more about the letters of recommendation right here while I have you all here is that um, with that they, yes, please get them in on time by the deadline. Um, I don't know historically like the numbers that we get to, but uh, with the competitive process, um, you know, it's the easy things to do are to get your materials in on time and correctly in the format requested that helps uh, set yourself apart and it starts, you know, your application off on the right foot with the hiring uh, and the selection of the review committee. So with that, just want to say a huge thank you to our alumni for kind of giving up a little over an hour of their night. I know you guys are busy, especially because Congress is in session now too. And it's a Monday night in December as we're facing numerous deadlines as Congress typically does at this time of year. So a huge thank you to Erica, Munfrey, and Coda uh, for taking some time to speak to the audience here today. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joining in both on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, we hope to, you know, answer your questions and hope to see your applications coming soon. Thanks. Hope you have all great night.